Christian. Él uh, es uh, ahora profesor en Lamont, en, que es un uh, instituto de uh, Columbia University en Nueva York. Él hizo su uh, licenciatura en Swarthmore College y luego su doctorado en Harvard. Después de Harvard se fue a Lamont a hacer su postdoctorado y un breve postdoctorado en IPGB en París también. Eh, luego fue profesor en Harvard eh, por alrededor de 15 años, después de cuales fue de regreso a Lamont otra vez eh, eh, y ha sido profesor ahí ya como algunos 10 años creo. Y él es, uh, sism uh, estudia sismología global, principalmente ha estudiado temblores uh, grandes y es líder del de Global CMT Project, que tiene un catálogo de sismos uh, que mide su magnitud y su mecanismo focal. Uh, des después de, o, o el catálogo abarca los años 1976 y hasta el momento, pero él ha sido el líder los últimos años. Uh, él también uh, tiene contribuciones muy importantes en el estudio de la estructura de la Tierra. Tiene, uh, uh, ha sido fellow de AGU desde 1999 y el año pasado tuvo el, el, la medalla de Beno Gutenberg de EGU. Eh, y lo, me puse a buscar eh, a él en Scopus y encontré más de 200 artículos. Pe, y iba a buscar las citas, pero no se puede buscar citas de más de 200 artículos en los últimos 15 años. Y en este periodo ha tenido casi 9000 citas. Y pues así se ve que uh, tiene contribuciones uh, muy importantes a la ciencia. Estamos contentos que está aquí. Muy bienvenido. Welcome. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come and visit. Uh, thank you to the leaders of the Institute, and thanks, of course, to Vava for organizing my visit. So, today, it's a little bit... So today, I want to speak to you about landslides. Well, first I should say, this is my first visit to Mexico City. And I have had the opportunity to see a little bit of the city on Sunday, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I have really enjoyed my first day at the Institute, and I expect to enjoy the second institute day at, my, at the Institute as well. So my topic today is the connection between landslides and seismology. So I will speak to you about both detection and the analysis that can be done of a landslide using the methods of seismology. But I should start probably with just a few words about landslides. It's not a science, there is a whole topic of course of studying landslides and you know that Mexico City is not immune to landslides. There was the landslide a few days ago in Santa Fe which shows how this is a real hazard that is present in many areas. I have, of course, I teach classes not only in seismology, but also in engineering, geology, things like that. So I've had, at some point, I have had to learn things about landslides. And so I just wanted to go over some of the very basics, which become important also when we discuss how we can use seismology to study landslides. So in general, we are talking about landslides when we discuss the motion of mass down a slope due to gravity. And there is a large, as I said, it's a whole field of study, so there is a lot of terminology about how we describe different types of landslides depending on what type of rocks or what type of soil they are moving as they as they do their thing, that is, they create this motion. So this is just a 
a textbook example of showing the mass that has moved. It involves generating a fault scarp, or actually a scarp that is a landslide scarp. It looks sometimes just like a fault scarp. The mass is driven down by gravity, and it typically spills out at the bottom. Now, for example, the landslide in Santa Fe was more like a rock drop or a rock slide where something falls down vertically, but it falls into the same category of mass movement driven by gravity. Landslides come big and small. Here is what I would consider a relatively small landslide, and it shows some landslides in Jackson, Wyoming in 2014, where this poorly consolidated actually looks more like just dirt. This side of the hill has started to develop a crack, driven possibly, probably, from excess rainfall, and you develop a, a fault, essentially, that drives this mass down. And this person was very unfortunate in that the house was built right on top of this. This is the type of thing that can be avoided using geotechnical engineering, where you investigate the soils and find out what's stable and what's not stable. Then, of course, there are the extremely large landslides. Here is the island of Oahu, one of the Hawaiian islands. And what you see here is the island. And then you see the bathymetry of the ocean. And here you see pieces of Oahu that have slid out into the ocean. Two million years ago, there was the Nuanu landslide, which transported these enormous masses of uh, basically the side of this volcano, hundreds, well, 200 kilometers into the ocean and depositing those on the side, on the bottom of the ocean. And here you can see the scarp that is still on Oahu from this event. So landslides come small and large, but they have the common denominator that they're driven by gravity. So from an engineering point of view, this has been understood. The basic mechanics have been understood for a very long time. Of course, as soon as you want to build a road or a railroad, you need to make sure that the road is stable. So typically, we look at the balance between the mass here, which is driven by gravity, resisted by friction at the bottom. And we talk about factors of stability, which is this balance between the driving forces and the resisting forces. And you always want the resisting forces to be larger. And I include this one because it shows that my home country, Sweden, was at the forefront of all of this 150 years ago to develop methods by which you could create or establish whether or not you will have a stable condition or not. The distinction between landslides and earthquakes, which I will get to in just a second, but first I will, well, I will get to it right now. There are certain characteristics of the two that are very similar. They both involve slip on a surface, and in an earthquake you have resistance stick, you have the sticking of two surfaces, and then you have the slip in the earthquake. That's the same in a landslide, or in many landslides anyway. It's exactly the same thing. You have a surface that is resisting motion, and then it cannot resist motion, and you have sliding. So the features that you see in the geology often are quite similar, and it can sometimes be hard to distinguish one from the other. But in some situations, it's very important to understand, are we dealing with a landslide, which would be in this cartoon, this part here, or are we dealing with a slide, or excuse me, with an earthquake fault, if we observe just the scarp right here? Why is it important? Because a landslide typically can be managed you can do things to make sure that you stabilize this mass. You can drain this soil, for example, and make sure that it doesn't, the friction is still high. Earthquakes, you cannot really stop. So this cartoon or figure is from a book about nuclear, nuclear plants in California, where these kinds of issues, is this a landslide or is it an earthquake fault, have, become, have been in the, uh, have been questions that scientists have had to um, address and resolve. These are just some general things about landslides. There are many 
and there are many questions about landslides that remain unanswered or poorly understood. And one of them is something that has been observed as long as people have tried to study and investigate landslides, especially large landslides, which is what I will be talking about. And that is that landslides tend to have an unexpectedly large, a low friction, coefficient of friction when you have a large landslide. What does this mean? Here we have a diagram showing, well, it's showing a very old slide in Switzerland. Switzerland is very mountainous. They have lots of landslides, and they had people studying landslides a long time ago, 100 years ago almost. So what this shows is a slope that became unstable, and you had this large mass of the mountain coming down here and then spreading out into the valley. So typically, rock-to-rock -rock friction is something like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, around that, in which case you should not get this rock, even though it gains momentum coming down here, it shouldn't travel very far. But in fact, what is observed for pretty much all large landslides of this type is that they spread out much further than can be predicted from a expected coefficient of friction. So this is called the mysterious, well, I call it, the mysterious run-out dynamics, which uh, still remains in the literature as something that people write papers about, trying to understand what actually, once you have destabilized this rock, maybe it's traveling at tens or even 100 meters per second when it gets down here. What are the dynamics of the rocks as they spread out into the valley that make it possible for them to spread out so far? So I'm not going to address that question in my talk. I'm simply trying to convey that landslides are interesting phenomena with many remaining unanswered questions. So in this talk, however, I will mainly talk about how we can detect and analyze the motions in, in landslides using seismology. So first I'll talk about event detection, finding landslides. Then I'll talk about some specific case studies of unusual seismic sources, primarily landslides, but not exclusively. And then I'll look at how we, this is more about detection, and this one is about trying to understand how the mass actually moves in individual landslides using the signals that are recorded um, by seismometers. But first I'll talk about the detection. I will not go into great detail, but I want to at least uh, give you the flavor of this. So here, I don't think I need to introduce you to how we locate earthquakes normally, because this is something that obviously is done in this institute. Many of you are involved in it. But the idea is, conceptually, an earthquake sends out waves, elastic waves. The waves travel through the Earth using, at some speed. They get recorded at some station, at many stations, and you can identify specifically the first arriving wave, the P wave, and, the, and in some earthquakes, other phases as well, the S wave, for example. And then, if those waves, in this case, actually, it turns out to be not too far from here, this example, if these waves from the earthquake here are recorded at different stations, they will be recorded as arriving, those waves will arrive at different times, and by triangulation and travel time curves, one can then figure out what the location is that is consistent with the arrival times at each of those stations. So this is done routinely by many agencies, national and international, and they almost exclusively use the P wave for these uh, detections that there has been an event, and location telling where the event was. So several years ago, I and my colleagues posed the question, what if there is an event that doesn't really generate much P wave energy or S wave energy, but does generate surface wave energy? Can we detect earthquakes only looking at surface waves? So surface waves, if we now look at a teleseismic, meaning long distance away from the earthquake, if we look at a typical seismogram, broadband seismogram, recorded by a modern seismometer, but equally well by an old seismometer, 
we see that there are different waves arriving. In this case, this is an earthquake in Hawaii that is recorded in California. We see the P wave. That would be the wave that is used normally to detect that an earthquake has happened. We see some other phase here. It's probably S. But then the largest amplitude at long periods is generated by the surface waves. So these are Rayleigh waves and love waves that travel along the surface of the Earth. They have this character that they're dispersed. Different waves at different frequencies arrive at different times. So they're not so easy to pick in an individual arrival time, but they are very large. So the question that we posed in terms of doing a different type of detection was to say, well, maybe there are earthquakes that have the characteristic that they don't generate the high frequency energy that is seen in P waves, but only generate the long periods that are seen in surface waves. So as I um, am a global seismologist primarily, so I was trying to do this on a global scale, trying to see, can we detect earthquakes on a global scale using surface waves? And the tool that we have at hand in terms of instrumentation is a global network of stations. And this is now the International Federation Network, uh, several countries are contributing their stations in an open fashion to the global seismological community and all of these data are essentially available in real time to the community for scientific use. So you collect data from all of these stations and then you analyze them. So the analysis to detect the events involves first filtering the data to long periods because I'm interested in events that generate long period surface waves. So in this case, long period means longer than 35 seconds. So here is, uh, each of these lines is a seismogram from one of the stations in the global network. This is two hours of, of data. And what we see here is that we see a wiggle at all of these stations, right? We see one prominent arrival and it actually shows this characteristic of being dispersed. So it turns out these are all Rayleigh wave arrivals. And the waves arrive at different times at different stations, which is natural because they are at very different distances away from the source. So the issue is then, if we just have this, can we figure out where the source was for these, for these wiggles? So that's a relatively well-posed problem. And the way that the algorithm that we use is uh, set up is that you search every four degrees in latitude and longitude on a grid covering the surface of the earth and you say well what if there was an earthquake here then the signals that we observe at that station would have traveled through this structure they would have experienced this dispersion that's along this path that one would have had a longer path that one would have a shorter path so then you go back to all of these seismograms and you correct the seismograms for this travel time or dispersion to each of the stations. And then when you have found the location that actually is corresponds to this, um, when you have made all of the corrections correctly, then all of these arrivals will actually be at the same time. And that leads to a way of detecting that an event has occurred. So there are technical details to this, but hopefully that I will not get into, but hopefully I have outlined, sketched that you can figure out where did these surface waves come from, and then you have the event detection. So we run this, the computer, this is something that you can tell a computer to do uh, quite efficiently. So this is running continuously. We are generating uh, these types of detections all the time. And generally we can detect earthquakes bigger than magnitude 5 using this method. And here is a typical, it's not for this, it's for last year, but it shows a typical list that you can find on our web page of all of these detections as they have. And what, so all of the lines here over a week or so, I guess, yeah, it's about five days, are each line is a detection that we have made. So here's an earthquake, for example, in Iceland and we yes, estimate based on the surface, surface waves that it has a magnitude of five. Now, 
pretty much every earthquake that we detect has already been detected by other agencies, right? Because they're normal earthquakes. So very rapidly, the United States Geological Survey, the uh, monitoring system in Vienna, international monitoring system in Vienna, they detect these things as soon as they have enough P waves, so within a very short amount of time. So all of the ones that are not colored pink were already reported by these other agencies. However, all of the pink ones are events that, at the time that I made this slide, were only in our catalog. So these are earthquakes that had not yet been detected using traditional means by other agencies. So it turns out that on the, in this particular week, you can see some of the locations, Southern East Pacific Rise, Southern East Pacific Rise, Nicobar Islands, that's uh, close to Myanmar, Tonga, Northern Mid-Atlantic Ridge, Reykjanes Ridge. These are all non-continental areas, which means that there are very few stations nearby, which means that probably the signals for traditional detection were not very large or not very good. So therefore, these are probably all normal earthquakes. They were just missed in the initial detection of, uh, by the traditional agencies. But this is a way that we develop a catalog of detections. And as I stress, most of these detections are just well-known earthquakes. There's nothing special about them. So here's uh, detected earthquakes for one year. So this would be, this is the year 2013 looking at all of the earthquakes that we detected and located using surface waves. And they come in different quality. Red is the best, green is very good, and yellow is just good. And as I said, most of these are, for the purposes of finding something unusual, they are uninteresting because they already have been found by somebody else. But then you take the two catalogs, or you take the most comprehensive global catalog is the one generated by the ISC, International Seismological Center. They do it in, with some delay, but they have a very complete catalog. So if you take their catalog, the USGS catalog, and then you compare it with our catalog, we can eliminate all of the events that have already been detected by the other people, and what's left are the ones that are just ours. So for 2013, the ones that are just ours look like this. So most of the events that are not in the standard catalogs are actually on the mid-ocean ridges and typically in the southern ocean where it is very hard to detect earthquakes for magnitude five and smaller using P waves, the traditional P waves. But then, as you can see, there are other events and I will talk about a few of them in just a second. One group of events that we have studied extensively, my colleague Meredith Nettles has in particular worked on this, are these events in Greenland, which are all associated with the calving of enormous icebergs. So they're not standard earthquakes. They are a different physical phenomena. But I'm not going to talk about that. I first want to talk about this event. What could that be? What happened in the Urals in February of 2013. Meteorite, exactly. We had a Chelyabinsk meteor. So there was, this was an atmospheric phenomenon, a very large meteor, probably 20 meters across, exploded in the atmosphere with uh, this tremendous light. And if you've seen any of the videos that people have happened to take on their in their cars in Russia. It's a fantastic uh, display of light. So what, why, what, does make, what makes that a seismic event? Well, our location turned out to be, from the seismic data, turned out to be, in fact, very close. This is our location, and this is Chelyabinsk. And you know that the effects, probably many of you, maybe, not, maybe some of you missed this fantastic geophysical event. But the effects were quite significant. And in particular, nobody was killed. But there was a lot of damage, actually. And this was sort of typical of the damage. This is all the windows of the drama theater in Chelyabinsk that all of the windows were pushed in. And uh, 
Some people were in fact injured by glass because they saw the flash, they walked to the window, and then came the pressure wave that exploded the windows. So the thing that is sensed on the ground when this thing explodes in the atmosphere is a pressure wave. And that pressure wave gets recorded by seismographs because they are just measuring how the earth, solid earth responds to this pressure. And here is what I believe was the closest broadband station. So this is uh, the RT. And what we see here is a broadband seismogram showing about 200 seconds. And what we see here, this is raw data. And for those of you who are familiar with or look at broadband signals, this is something weird here because what we have is a, is a long period signal without anything happening in before. So geophysically, what happens? Well, as I said, this 20 tons of rock coming from outer space heats up and explodes. And as it explodes, it generates a pressure wave. It turns out that a lot of people have spent a lot of time investigating what happens when you have a large explosion in the atmosphere, uh, meaning people who are interested in large nuclear bombs. And there were lots and lots of experiments to figure out if we explode the bomb at five kilometers, what does it look like? Let's go do a test. What about at 10 kilometers? Let's go do a test, and et cetera. So all of that went on in the 50s in, in the US and in the Soviet Union until people sensibly decided to stop testing nuclear bombs in the atmosphere. But a lot was learned. So in particular, if you have this explosion, how it generates a pressure wave, an overpressure on your surface. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's very complicated. Uh, it, and it's not linear stuff. Uh, how you go from that extremely hot explosion to a, a pressure wave. But in the end, what you have is basically a force, a pressure, a force on the Earth's surface that has some duration and then it's over. So what does that do? That imparts an impulse on the Earth's surface. So in general, we can think of this. Obviously, it's not happening just there, right? It's spread out over some area. But in general, you will see just a push on the Earth's surface. So going back to Lamb's problem, one of the earliest papers saying, well, how should we understand seismic waves in the Earth? So he and solve the problem. You push down on your surface, what should you observe in terms of a seismic signal at some distance? So we know how to do this. Also, under, with the, taking into account that the Earth is not a half space, but it's a sphere and that is heterogeneous and so on. And we use it all the time when we analyze earthquakes. So the only thing we needed to do in order to understand or quantify this event was to change our codes to not look for a moment tensor, which is the traditional description nowadays for an earthquake. A moment tensor is just a system of forces. But if we just invert for a force, that's actually simpler. So if we do that, and here's an example of the blue being observed seismograms at this station RT, filtered to long periods where we really understand wave propagation. And the red lines are the synthetic seismograms that correspond, we have inverted for the impulse that was imparted to the Earth. So it turns out in the inversion, we got something that was not quite vertical, but it had a, you know, 2.8 times 10 to the 27 dyne seconds, I guess. Force times time, push. So with that, I want to just illustrate that, in fact, other things, other forces can also generate seismograms, and it makes sense. Now, now, let's, let's go, go to another, another event. Actually, two events. events. In Utah, Utah, in March, I think, of 2013, I woke, I woke up, up and there were two, two, in our detector had two magnitude five earthquakes in Utah. I went to the USGS, yes, they had nothing, nothing, which is very odd, because we're here in a very populated area. It's right next to Salt Lake City, in fact, these events. So there was a mystery for not very long because it turns out that it was in the news. And what was it? It was associated with this feature. 
This is the largest man-made hole in the earth. It's the uh, Bingham Canyon Mine, just outside of Salt Lake City. It's four kilometers across and one kilometer deep. And people have been digging this hole for more than 100 years. Not for pleasure, but to extract copper and silver and gold and molybdenum, palladium, all kinds of things. So as you can see here, this mine then has developed something that has quite steep sides. And on the morning of, I guess, April 11th, this collapsed, like so. And here you can see all the way from the top, the flank of the mine went down all the way to the bottom. And here's the visitor center. Um, so they actually knew that something was going to happen because this mine, they have strain meters in the mine, and they were actually doing um, radar sounding across the mine, so they saw that things were starting to move. So they, nobody was in the mine, nobody was hurt. They had evacuated, and they had actually, so these, the way that you do this, I guess, is you drive up with these enormous trucks. I mean, trucks of a size that you cannot even imagine, almost. Uh, so they had parked them at the bottom because they thought something's going to happen up here, but that's it. But in fact, the landslide went all the way down to the bottom, and if you look for this event, you can see these, it looks like toy trucks that are just spilled all over the bottom of the mine. Uh, of this enormous character, right? You, you know what I'm talking about. The wheels are three stories high or something like that, right? So enormous event. So this, this event then was large enough to generate this seismic detection, generated Rayleigh waves that were observed all around the world. So now the next thing is, how do we understand that generation of seismic waves? So as I said, there's a distinction between landslides and faults because they are actually driven by different forces. I've emphasized that landslides are always driven by gravity. But an earthquake is driven by tectonic stresses that are generated by the motion of plates or pieces of the lithosphere or the crust. So we think of earthquakes as you have these forces that push things together, you build up stress in the rock, and then the stress is released by motion on the fault. So it took a while for people to figure out, well, what, how can we represent that in terms of forces that are active in the Earth? And the double couple mechanism refers to a description of the forces that act on the elastic Earth when an earthquake occurs. So the way we should think about an earthquake, so we're, I'm now talking about the earthquake source, is that we have two couples of forces that suddenly are turned off. So there's one couple that acts across the fault. Now, if that were the only force couple that acted, then you would generate a torque and you would have rotation. Now, there is no rotation that re results from earthquake. So the description that we used to explain the stress release involves a perpendicular set of a perpendicular force couple acting in this way. So when we model the seismic waves from an earthquake, we basically are saying, what is the response of the elastic earth to turning on one set of forces like so and one set of forces like so. And that gives us seismograms. With a landslide, it's different. We're not really releasing stress in the same way. What we are doing is that, and this is a cartoon from a paper by Hasegawa Kanamori, they, who already back then figured out what we should think about is that this block here, so here we have a mass that is feeling gravity. When it, for some reason, the friction goes to zero or goes below the static friction, it starts sliding down here and it accelerates. So it's experiencing a change of momentum due to the force component of gravity. Now, for every force of action, there is a force of reaction. So as this mass slides in that direction, it pushes back on its substrate in the opposite direction. And one can even think about it in terms of a 
a, if you think of a mass that is dangling, it's hanging below, this mass is hanging below my other hand. So it's pulling down on this, my right hand, but if we release and this starts falling, my hand will spring back if it has been elastically deformed. So that's as if there's a force moving in the upwards direction. So there's a force balance that is, the, the mass that is sliding is obviously changing its momentum, which means that the MVT, the MVDT is the force acting on that mass. Newton also says there has to be a reaction force. That reaction force is acting on the rest of the Earth. Force on the Earth is the negative of the momentum change of the slide. So it's actually, this is not necessarily an easy thing to internalize, but once you do, it's actually extremely simple. If we see something moving, the, the landslide is moving, it moves because there's a force acting on it, but that force has to be reacted against, and that reaction is sensed by the Earth. So here's you know, uh, an example that sort of, you, you, you can imagine that you are the landslide mass, and whatever trajectory you have, if you go through a sudden bump or you get turned to the right, that generates a force on the structure that then, if that structure is connected to the solid earth, would generate seismic waves. This, by the way, is the famous cyclone uh, roller coaster in New York City, which even though it is very old, is extremely scary. So hopefully I've convinced you that if you have a mass sliding down, or even if you have a mass dropping down, there is going to be a responding force on the Earth. And we already said that if we know the force acting on the Earth, we can make the seismogram. So we go the other way. We have the seismogram, we go back and determine from the seismograms the force. So what we have done then is to develop a method by which we determine the force history of a landslide. So we analyze the seismograms in that inverse way, we match them with synthetic seismograms, allowing the model to be a force that changes with time. So the result of that is what we call LFH, or landslide force history. And the force will have three dimensions, up, east, west, north, south. And what we see in this diagram then is the force acting on the Earth that as we have determined it from seismograms for the first of the two events in the Bingham Canyon mine landslide. So what we see here is that the red is the vertical force. So the first thing that happens is that as the mass detaches, the Earth actually experiences a force upwards because it's no longer dragged down by the mass. So we have a force up, and then the mass comes down to the bottom, it pushes down on the Earth, and that's it. And the yellow, or the green and blue corresponds to the horizontal forces and they, they correspond, correspond to the, the pushing away, away from the, the side, side of the landslide, landslide to, in this case, a combination in, I don't really remember now, northwest, I guess, pushing away towards the northwest, and then initially pushing away, and then as it slows down, by dragging the earth along with it, pushes in the opposite direction. So from this force history, then, we can see that the landslide took about, this goes from minus 40 to 40 or so seconds, so it's a minute and a half, about 80 to 90 seconds. It took from the up there to down to the bottom. Okay, so that's the force history. Now the beautiful thing, I think, is that still using simple mechanics, we can learn something more. Because the forces that we determine acting on the Earth is, we said, the negative of the momentum change of the slide. Okay, but then we can integrate the force to get the impulse on the Earth as a function of time. So that's just going to be the negative of the momentum, because if you integrate that, you just get the momentum of the mass. So we, in fact, have a way of getting the momentum as a function of time during the slide. But you can integrate one more time. So this is just mv, right? So if you integrate the impulse, integrate the negative of the momentum, we get the negative of the mass times the displacement, because V integrated is just displacement. So if we can make the assumption that the mass stays more or less the same, 
we can integrate twice and we get the trajectory. Because V is a vector, x, y, z, just as f was a vector, x, y, z. So we not only get the force acting on it, but we can get a trajectory. So from the seismic waves, from that force history, we get the trajectory. And here it is for this mine, for this landslide. From the seismology alone, and what's outlined here is this is a topography of the mine. This outlines the main area of the landslide. So the centroid or the center of mass, we estimate, we don't know, we estimate that it's up at this point on the slope. And then this is where the deposits ended up. And in fact, from the seismology alone, we get this curved trajectory down to the bottom. There's one trick. The colors are associated with, they are separated um, by five seconds. And I think I have a slide later on that indicates where the mass, center of mass is during this trajectory. So there's one trick. And that from the seismic data, we don't get mass independently. So we have to, and if mass is one, then you get d equals to something. If mass is two, then you get d equals to half. So the way that we do that is we, meaning we scale the trajectory, not the shape, but the overall size of the trajectory, we can't get from the seismology. So when we have a figure like so, we can say, well, this could have been an enormous mass that just came down like so. But in fact, we know that the deposits are down here, so then we scale it, and then we get an estimate of the mass. So that's, so that's how we, how we get, get the mass using the seismology plus some, some image of the, of the slide. So we have applied this. So first I'll just tell you some systematics. Uh, we applied this to a number of landslides that we had detected. And our processing goes this, like so. We get a seismic detection. We verified, verified that it actually is a landslide because sometimes it's not so easy to know whether it's a landslide or an earthquake, but if we can find satellite imagery or a news report, as in the case of the mine, we knew that there was a landslide. Then we can determine the force history and then we scale the trajectory to fit the imagery. And uh, we can then determine mass and kinematic parameters. So now I just want to go through a couple of examples of significant landslides around the world that we have analyzed. And actually the one that we first, so I should say my colleague Colin Stark is a geomorphologist who is, is doing the geomorphology meaning landslide, interpreting our results in terms of um, the landslide process. And we got initially intrigued by this, by some detections now several years ago in Taiwan. In 2009, again, I woke up one morning and there were four detections that were not in other catalogs, mainly five or so earthquakes in Taiwan, which normally reports even very small earthquakes. They have a very good seismic network. So these events happened during one of the worst typhoons that they experienced over the last half century. This was Typhoon Maracot, which came across and basically sat over Taiwan for a long period of time. And the rainfall was in one place over a 48 hour period was two meters. Two meters of rainfall over 48 hours. So water destabilizes slopes because it lowers the effective pressure that holds together soils and faults. So one of the events, so these four events were all landslides. And here's the worst landslide of them all in terms of casualties. 450 people lived in this village. This is the before picture. And here's the after picture. The village was obliterated. And there you can see uh, another picture of the slide. And the remarkable thing about this event was that it wasn't known that a landslide had occurred for almost 48 hours because the village was totally, there was no communication with the, with the village after the slide had occurred. And there were numerous, hundreds of landslides of different sizes in Taiwan over that 48 hour time period 
this was one of the largest. So from a scientific point of view, it allowed us to test some of our methods because in fact in Taiwan they have extremely good uh, terrain models or uh, elevation models so they could do before and after. And what's shown in the colors here is the Xiaolin slide, yellow indicating loss of elevation. So in this case, the yellow and red indicates that in fact the top of this hill had been decimated by 30 or 50 meters. And then the blue indicates the deposit zone which shows 30 to 50 to 70 meters of deposit. And we can then, with that ground truth, we can look at what our trajectory would be from the seismology. And in fact, there is extremely good agreement between the two. And we also then get an estimate of the mass volume. Well, we get the mass from the force of 60 million tons. So typically, it's not easy to do estimate the sizes of landslides because you need to know exactly what the land looked like before in order to use the pictures from after to get the full volume. Another example, this is again uh, associated with rain. This is on the Key Peninsula in Japan and this is showing uh, a landslide of a slightly smaller landslide. <coughs> I think it's about 10 million tons. And here we had the ability to use regional seismic uh, waves to do the inversion. And again, here's the slide, a very simple straight down slide into a valley. We get the same result from seismology as you get from analyzing the images. Third example, I think the examples are interesting, so I have several of them. This is one that occurred in a very remote area that nobody would ever have known about if we had not detected it using seismology. And here is a, an image of, from the Karakoram on the India-Pakistan border. I guess it's in India. So here we have a glacier coming down from these very tall mountains. Here's the, this is the valley, here's the mountain range. So we, had, we detected seven landslides over a period of a few days. And then we were able to get the satellite imagery. An old image existed. And then there was a new image that was acquired. And here we can see how this prism of rock has basically come down and covered most of this glacier. So you should remember that, in fact, when you see pictures of these glaciers in the high mountains and you see all of these uh, dark lines, right? That, that's debris from landslides that has come down and been deposited on the glacier. So the remarkable thing about these, these this landslide or these landslides was that, in fact, there were seven large landslides over three days. And this is something that you would never have known if you had only seen the deposits. Because the deposits are so mixed up that it would be very difficult to discern that there were several large landslides. But in fact, there were seven of them and we determined the trajectories as so. So we have learned some things about the detection and also the, how we can measure the sizes of these landslides by having looked at several of these events now. So in fact, we are able to, when we first detect the landslides, we attribute the, well, we say that the amplitudes of these Rayleigh waves that we use for the detection, we convert that into a, a magnitude. And if one compares that magnitude with the forces that we determined through greater, through more in detail analysis, we find a pretty good agreement. So even if we just have detected something, we can typically say, what is the maximum force? And once we've done the analysis to get the force, we have found that we can also predict the mass. So here are 30 or so events for which we have done the analysis. We have the force, we can predict the mass of the land. That event up there is the flank collapse of Mount St. Helens. This is the largest in 1980. This is the largest one in the last 40 years, largest flat. From the seismic analysis, we can also determine the accelerations. Now the accelerations vary because the slopes of individual landslides are, some are very shallow, which in which case gravity can only accelerate you so fast. If it's a very steep slope, 
you can get very rapid accelerations. And we can estimate some other parameters as well, in this case, maximum momentum from seismology. So this is not the final conclusions. I still have a few more slides. But at this point, I led you through this, and I hope I've convinced you that we can use it to detect and locate landslides. We can use seismology for that. And in fact, we can use the seismic signals to get masses and trajectory. And then the third thing here, seismic force histories can be used to investigate and constrain models of the landslide process. So this is sort of the next step, right? As a seismologist, I think this is really interesting. But is it interesting for people who are interested in landslides? That's sort of the test, right? Are they, do they learn something from the seismologically determined things? And I want to illustrate that I believe we can, in fact, learn something new about landslides. And I'll show an example. Then I'm done. So we're back to Bingham Canyon. People have known for a very long time that landslides show up in seismograms. Maybe you see them in Mexico. I don't know. And when people look at local recordings of landslides, they typically have this very weird, so these are short period records and from the Bingham Canyon, that large landslide in the mine. And they typically have this very weird characteristic that they start extremely emergently and then grow like a cigar and then come back down again like so. So this is why you don't see any P waves, S waves. You just see this sort of noise that gets stronger and then gets weaker. So people have tried to interpret this as a gradual start to the landslide, which would be a logical inference. But in fact, now that we have local recordings and we have the force history, we can actually say that that's not what happens. Because in this case, the maximum force, this is the force, the maximum the force in the landslide. The maximum force is achieved extremely early on. And the only way that the maximum force can be happening so early is if the whole mass is, has started to accelerate. If you have just a trickle of mass, small boulders starting to roll down the hill, you won't get the force being as large as this. So instead what this means is that the mass starts sliding at some fraction of gravity, so maybe two meters per second squared, something like that. Immediately there's a large mass involved. It's not yet generating much short period energy. Once it speeds up, this is our current thinking about this, once the mass starts speeding up and it's traveling at 20 meters per second, 30 meters per second, the whole thing disintegrates. And you start getting boulders bouncing on each other, etc. So you generate a lot of high frequency energy that goes on for the whole time of the landslide. And then, in this case, we get a stopping phase when the mass hits the wall on the other side of the mine. So we think that, in fact, here's the color, here are the colors of those dots. This is indicating where the landslide was at a given time. So you can see where it turns around here is essentially at the time when we get this last burst of short period energy probably when suddenly that mass hits the wall on the other side. I will say just three more slides. So also, what about also? This might not ring a bell to you, but also was the worst landslide disaster in the US in the last century, I believe. More than 40 people were killed in a development outside of Seattle. So this landslide was very strange. Here you see the after effect of the, uh, the landslide, very gentle topography, clearly unstable. That's the after picture. It cross came down, crossed a river, and went over into a suburban neighborhood over here where the casualties occurred. In fact, geomorphologists who have looked at the before picture says you can see that this landscape is in fact has scarps that suggest previous landslides coming down into this river previously, but that had not stopped development. So this is actually, compared to the landslide that I've talked to you about previously, this is a relatively small landslide from my global perspective of detecting them. But 
there were seismic signals, and indeed in this landslide as well, when we do the analysis, we were able to use some regional stations. We find the same thing, that even though the short period records start very gradually, the force immediately goes to a very large force, indicating that a very large block of this side, the side of the mountain started moving almost instantaneously, and then it broke up and generated this very uh, hummocky and spread out debris. And in the process of that, generated a lot of short period as well, short period energy as well. So this is simply to point out that also was a lot smaller than any of the other events that we have analyzed, suggesting that where you have good regional networks, you can both look for and analyze these types of events on a, on a smaller scale as well, because they do generate seismic energy, and that energy can be analyzed for physical processes. So I'm back to my conclusions, and I will end there. Thank you.